Thank you very much, Michael. It's actually a great, uh, even as Ukrainian, it's a great honor to, uh, for me to participate in the school. Uh, I don't know how much time it will take. Probably, I hope students will have uh, some time to ask me questions. Sometimes I will also ask questions, so please don't be shy. I expect at least a few answers from the, and correct answers, of course, from the audience. Uh, in case something is not clear, or maybe I will rush a bit, uh, you can always like slow slow down to me or and write in the chat some comments. I hope Metro will help me uh, to interrupt me and uh, re read the comments out loud. Okay, so let's proceed. So today we'll talk about continuous optimization. Continuous optimization is what I'm doing. This is my uh, main field of expertise. Uh, but in particular, I will also talk about application of continuous optimization for machine learning. So the central problem of continuous optimization is to minimize a function. So we have a function f, and sometimes we have a constraint. Here I depict it as x belongs to the set c. For instance, the interval x belongs to minus 3, 3 can be a constraint. Uh, we say there are two fields which are not very connected in mathematics, continuous optimization and discrete optimization. Discrete optimization is, is a hard subject because most of the algorithms, they are, are combinatorial uh, because the variable is discrete, like minus one, plus one, and so on. Like only they take integer values and so on. So in this, for this problem, uh, x is kind of a continuous variable. It, it, it can take any real value. And because of that, it's actually maybe surprisingly, I don't know, at the first glance, but because of that, we can solve much, much, much better problems of this type. Uh, it's like kind of standard in optimization, talking about minimization problems. But of course, in practice, sometimes you want not to minimize some quantity, but to maximize. And I hope it's obvious that like, if you take minus f, then maximization problems always uh, uh, can be converted into a minimization problem, right? So that's, that's basically very standard. And I think uh, in high school, in the 11th grade, 12th grade, uh, some simple problems of this type, uh, students like uh, have to be familiar with. Uh, at least when you know, when you take some derivative, like you you, you learn some basic of analysis. I think that's exactly uh, the the, um, this, the the lecture will mention uh, all this stuff. Uh, okay, so let's let's understand why do why do we need this field? What is interested in it, and and so on. So continuous optimization is a part of applied mathematics, and uh, and applied of mathematics as as it can be like clear from the name, of course is interested in applications. So here we are interested actually in applications. So it's not just theory for the sake of theory, we need to solve some real world problem. So let's see who actually needs this optimization. Uh, we consider a few examples. So the first example comes from physics. In, the, in physics, maybe you know that there is such thing as at least actions, uh, and many laws can be can be described by, by, by this law. Every, like either energy one, uh, some system want to minimize some energy, or like in in case uh, of optics, uh, the, the light that passes through through some medium, right? You know that it it, it goes not just by direct line, but like it, it has some some strange uh, uh, like pattern. And this is because uh, the light wants to travel as quickly as possible from one point to, to another. And because of that, we have such a trajectory. So the, the light wants to take the, the smallest possible time, the, the, the least one. And that's the reason of this trajectory. So if like we optimize this problem, find the solution, we will find that the trajectory of, of light has to follow this pattern. And because of that, we, we have this famous snail, uh, snail law. Uh, and this is just an example from the physics, but many, many things. Basically, all physics can be described as, uh, or at least classical mechanics, as uh, some optimization problems, or, or in more general, they call it variational problems. Uh, so that's physics. What you have, like, 
in real life we have some economics and probably it's not a surprise that basically the main goal in economics if you at a company or a businessman you want to maximize your profits right this is a basic axiom in in modern economics uh, it's not that you just maximize your profit yet right you have some constraints you cannot pollute whatever there are some laws that you have to obey and so on so you have some constraints but overall your total goal is to maximize the profit uh, so that's a part of optimization problem right so very very clear you just need to formulate it properly in mathematical terms but that's, that's a very clear optimization problem uh, actually maybe you never thought about this but a lot of things in in mathematics completely like not not applied problems can be also translated as optimization problem so on the left uh, on the left we see a very classical inequality right we know that it, it it's true for all uh, positive x uh, no negative xyz but we can transform like if you don't know how to prove it we can solve it as a or at least formulate it as an optimization problem right uh, it's equivalent if we show that the right hand side this minimization part uh, the value is three right so we, we can translate the classical inequality into a very uh, simple minimization problem and since in mathematics at least in analysis like half of half of mathematics is about inequalities you want to prove some bounds uh, like but even if you want to, to prove some serum in the in the middle of the serum there are many many intermediate results where you want to prove some bound uh, so that's basically all these type of inequalities are actually can be formulated as optimization problem and today we will talk mostly in terms of application about engineering so right now I will not mention but probably you understand that as well in engineering if you want to do to build something or to, to to use as less resources as possible or to make it as reliable as possible you don't want to stop it somewhere in the middle you want to do it as best as you can that's a very simple like um, human desire why to stop somewhere in the middle if you can improve something so and a lot in, in engineering you say like that's exactly what we are doing we want to do it in the best possible way subject to some constraints uh, okay so we will need some theory of course I cannot just use school mathematics we will need it a bit one one level higher but just just a bit it won't be too too much so just like two slides of very simple mathematics uh, so in, in 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 fact we will talk not about r as I formulated in the first slide but we'll talk about space rn so to, in order to understand rn not many it's hard to imagine the space rn so we will do basically by analogy so let's recall what is r1 r2 r3 familiar spaces and we just say we will do it by analogy that's a, that's everything what we need so in r1 it, it right it's, it's clear how to, what we can do addition we can this is just number the main operation that we're interested in is multiplication we know what multiplication is we take two numbers multiply is it now if we have r2 which means a plane uh, so in the plane we have such an important operation so now points in the plane we call them vectors right a any point in the plane is a vector and the most important operation be between vectors is a scalar product so the scalar product if you remember the formula uh, we will denote it by, by dot so it's the formula x1 y1 plus x2 y2 so I, I hope it, it's clear but also maybe you remember the formula that it's a length of one vector multiplied by length of another vector multiplied by cosine of the angle between them they are equivalent but for us it's important the the, the former problem uh, former formula from the letter and notice that I use different fonts I don't I, at least when I was at school we used to write vector the arrow uh, above the the letter to, to denote the vector so in mathematics it's not that common so instead I would use the font like bold font x so bold font x and like x1 x2 are uh, curly it's uh, denote its coordinates so I hope you understand what is r2 right we have vector x consists of two coordinates and we can do scalar product between vectors 
very important operation. Just let's see what we can do in R3. So in R3, we have basically the same. We just put comma, add another coordinate, the third one, and have the same scalar product basically. Just again, plus, plus, x3, y3. And you don't need to be super smart just to do it like by analogy, right? It's even if you never thought about Rn, it's so natural. Like if you did it for R2 and for R3, if, even if you have no idea about Rn, like why not to do it? It's, it's it just ask like us to, to, to continue. And that's how we get Rn. So we cannot imagine Rn, no one can. You can like R2, R3 basically is a maximum. Our brain doesn't allow anything extra. But for mathematics, this abstraction is super convenient. Like prob probably the most, the most important thing in, in, in mathematics. So that's, how, that's, that's what is RN for us. It's a collection of N coordinates and tuple, one can say. And we have a standard st scalar product. S multiplied by Y is just sum of XI, YI. Okay. So just by analogy. And again, if anytime you're confused by Rn, just forget about n and think that n is two. That's an old joke. Runs actually. Okay. But no no questions. I'm sorry, if you if you actually know very well what is Rn, sorry for wasting wasting our time. Uh, okay. That's a one piece of information that is useful to know. Even if you don't care about optimization, it's still super useful to know. And the second piece is optimality condition. I think you know very well this optimality condition in R, and now we just need to extend it to Rn. So the theorem says the following. If function f is differentiable, and I will not main, like recall what is differentiability. It's a difficult notion. I hope you remember what is in R. Uh, but so basically, we assume that it's, it's a nice function, like kind of smooth. Like you can you can draw it nicely and so on. That's for us is enough. To, to, that's that's what for us differentiability means. So if function f is differentiable, and x is a solution of this problem, uh, I mean f x, then the derivative must be zero. Um, okay. First, notice that this is unconstrained problem. When I don't write anything below below mean, it means that there is no constraints, no set. So that's, that's, that's important to remember. But more, more importantly probably is to understand what is this derivative, because we know very well what is the derivative in R, but what is the derivative in Rn? So the derivative, it's very, it, in Rn is very easy. It's basically, it's a vector again. And the first coordinate of this vector is when we just take derivative with respect to X1 variable, meaning that we say that X2, Xn are all parameters. We don't care, it's like numbers. And we just take derivative with respect to x1. Then we do we take derivative with respect to x2 and just collect all these n components together. That's how we get derivative. So let's see an example. We have a f of x is this simple function. So what will be the derivative? We take we take derivative with respect to x1 is 2x1, 2x1, that's what I wrote. But of course I make, make a mistake, right? It's not difficult to see that I made a mistake because the correct derivative, which I did uh, by a computer, I often do mistakes. And of, also it's very important to know how to calculate derivatives by hand. It's also important to know how to check to verify uh, your calculation. So in my case, I made a typo, but I also was smart enough to, to check myself on a computer whether I made a mistake or not. So I just wrote some simple code and it gave me the symbolic derivation of the derivative. So this is wrong. Yeah, I forgot x2, right? Because if I take derivative with respect to x1, it has to be 2x1 multiplied by x2, of course. And then I do derivative with respect to, to x2. That's good to know, but more important for us that we understand what is a derivative. Also, I say derivative, more kind of common term for this, for this, uh, vector would be a gradient. So maybe sometimes I would just forget that I, I started to call it derivative. Sometimes I may say gradient. For us, it's the same. 
as there is some some small, small small differences, but for us it's not important. So sometimes may, maybe I will say gradient, sometimes derivative. For us, it's just equivalent things. Uh, okay, and what does it mean actually? This equation, the equation is that derivative is equals to zero. So in R, because we know that the derivative actually represent the the tangent of the angle, it means that the derivative is like a flat, right? This line. So that's basically the same analogy uh, is applied in Rn. So if you look at the some picture, so let's say this is a function f, and we want to minimize it in the interval minus three, three, some random function. We don't care what, what it is. Uh, so, so what does it mean? What the theorem says? The theorem says that like, okay, you don't know how to find minimum. Find first where your derivative is zero. You will, you will have some finite number of points, let's, let's hope. And then among those points, you can, you can choose actually what is the minimizer or what is not, right? You can just actually calculate the value. Uh, so if a compute derivative, right? You see that we have three kind of minimum. And we see that actually it's, it's really flat. The, the, the derivative here is flat. And by flat, I mean, if I take this, this like boxes, right? You see that it's actually really coincide. If I take it, if I zoom it further, you'll see it's close and close. And I can continue until basically two lines in a small neighborhood will be just undistinguished, undistinguished either for computer or for other eyes. So let's go back. So here we have three minimizers. Some, some minimizers among them are local, which means that Oh, and some are global. Global is the best minimizer. It's basically such minimizers that you cannot have a better one. So we have this one, right? This minimizer is the best. It has the smallest value, minus 50 something. And here, this, this, these two are local minimizers. But this is not all, that's important. So also, and, and I'm sure you remember this from school, that when we do constraint minimization, we also have to check boundary. In this case, boundary is easy to check. It's only minus three and three. So we have another two points. And here, and they're also local minimizers because in the neighborhood, and we have neighborhood only like slightly smaller than three or slightly larger than minus three, the values are larger. So basically they're also local minimizers, but of course the derivative here is not zero, right? So that's important to remember. So if, if point kind of inside of a set, not not on the boundary. Then we have the derivative zero. But sometimes it may happen that it's it's on the boundary. It still can be as uh, of a solution of a minimizer, but the derivative is not zero. So for this point, and that's the, actually the most difficult case. You read as a, a question by yep. yep. Um. What about the um flat points at like the top around negative two point eight, negative one point five, one point three, and. Two point one point eight. okay yes this one right this one this one yeah yeah so as i said the theorem was formulated like this if x is a minimizer then the derivative uh, is zero uh, but it's not 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 conversely so the derivative might be zero but it's actually local minima ma maximizer this is maximizer this is maximizer this is maximizer and this is maximizer which is of course expected because we know that f and minus f uh, we can trans trans tra transfer minus f maximization uh, by minus f taking minus f maximization into minimization but derivative if it's zero it doesn't matter about the sign minus so that's expected so of course when you, we are going to solve equation f prime the, the derivative is zero we will find all the points both maximum and minimums and we have to judge which which are these points whether they are good for us or bad for us but that's a good question. Yes, so not not it's not that like it's it's equivalent statement. It it like it implies so if x is 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 minimizer, then we have this, but not conversely. Uh, okay, I hope it's clear. But if not, continue asking. Let's go further. Okay, and despite despite what all you're doing at school. How do you do it at school? Because I'm sure some of you did some exercise at school, but you have some function, uh, you find derivative, there are, there are three, three, four points, 
you computed the values and, and just said like, okay, this is not on the boundaries and there is zero. Oops, this is minimizer, this is maximizer, whatever. In practice, we don't do this. And I will show in a moment why we don't do this. In fact, we, in mathematics, we, at least at school, we, we always like to solve everything exactly, right? If you do a small mistake, your teacher won't be, won't be happy. In real life, we never do anything exactly. We only do approximate, everything approximately. I, I mean, in practice, I mean, with a computer and so on. And of course, the main reason, that, like the first, like, first basic reason is that computers, they don't represent real numbers. They only do approximate computation, at least in 90% of cases. Uh, so that's the first source of error. And second source of error is basically most of the problems you cannot solve exactly. Just you cannot simply it's like it's not possible you can only solve them approximately uh, that, that's the reason why we, are, we will talk about iterative methods so that's how we, we solve these problems in practice meaning that we choose some initial point x0 in our vector space arbitrary we construct some algorithm based on the properties of our function that, that we know whatever based on some knowledge that we will in, in, uh, we'll get at university let's say uh, it's your experience and so on and then we run a procedure algorithm. So we run it like a for loop, right? We say that our next iterate, xk plus one, is this algorithm and all previous iterations that we calculated. And we, we, we run it for some time, either for some finite number of iterations or when we have some stopping criteria or when we just check when it's converged, some things are converging and so on. So in the sense that we will never converge exactly to the value we're interested. But in practice, we don't care because in practice, if you can solve the problem with arbitrary precision, it's enough for us. We don't care about like last digits of irrational number, of course. Last, they don't, I mean, they don't have last numbers, but in a sense, like after whatever, six numbers, six digits. So that's a, that is what iterative math, right? It's basically, you start from X0, then you, then you calculate some x1, then you calculate x2, then you calculate xk, until xk is not far from the solution. So I hope it's clear. And let's explain why we actually need iterative method, even for school things. So let's solve very easy problem, minimize a polynomial, polynomial of one variable. So one, the polynomial that you already did like dozens of exercises like this. So this is a generic formula for polynomial. D is a degree of polynomial, of course. And our goal is to solve, uh, to minimize this polynomial subject to standard uh, interval uh, uh, bounds. So L denotes the left, uh, be the beginning of the sec interval, and R denotes the right, the, uh, the, the, the right end of interval. So, which means based on our theory from the previous slide, if X is minimizer, what we have to do? We have to find all the, all the uh, zeros of the derivative, all x where derivative is zero, and not forget to check the boundary, right? But boundary here is just two points, so that's all, all what we need. Very clear algorithm. The derivative of the uh, polynomial is it's one, it's one dimensional, right? On the axis variable, so we can, of course, calculate it very, very easily. It's just this one. And notice that the derivative makes a degree of polynomial from d to d minus one. So what does it mean? So if you started from polynomial of the degree higher than, higher than four, um, higher than six, then the derivative will have a degree at least five. And I don't know whether you know, but it's very cool and important fact that there are no generic formula and it, can, it cannot be, it's not just that we are not smart enough. It's like, we can prove that there cannot be a formula for polynomial, for, for roots of polynomials uh, that has degree more than four. Meaning that we cannot hope to find a formula, in a sense, some exceptional polynomial, polynomials, easy one, like xn equals to one, right? We can, we can solve it for, of course, uh, for any n, but except like generic polynomials, there are no formulas. No, like for, I mean, by formula, like the ones that you have for quadratic polynomials. We have the same for cubic polynomials and even for fourth order polynomials, although the formula looks super ugly, but at least they exist. 
for polynomial of the degree five and higher, no chances. So you cannot. Meaning that even such a simple problem as a polynomial, right? Polynomial in one dimensional. Uh, so we want to minimize. We actually cannot solve exactly. So that's why. So that's why we need to do some approximation. And I will show you example of such an approximation that actually maybe will persuade you persuade you that yeah, actually very quickly you can solve this problem approximately. And who cares if you uh, slide like not exactly find the solution. So the, the, the simplest method to solve, to minimize a polynomial is called a bisection method. And, by, and I will forget about minimization for a moment and instead I will talk about finding the root of the function because we know that, right? That minimization is kind of equivalent to solving an equation, like finding a zero of a function. It's not like exactly equivalent, equivalence, but for us it's sufficient. So, we will talk about, we will mention a very basic fact from, from analysis. So if function f is continuous, we have two points, a and b, and we know that at a, its function is negative, at b, it's positive. And because function is continuous, it cannot jump. It must kind of passes the line, which is, which is zero. So that's, that's what this statement says. So if, if it takes two, values of the opposite sign, there must be a value where a function takes zero because otherwise it just cannot switch like from, from minus to plus, right? There must be some x where it takes zero. And that's the, that's the property we are going to use uh, to, de to develop our algorithm. So our goal is to find a zero, an approximate zero of our function f. For, for this, it works. We don't even need to assume that f is polynomial. It's a very generic and powerful method. It works for any f if you know that on this interval a, b, that uh, it takes two different values. So the method is the following. We take the, why it's called bisection. We take a point c, which is in the middle of our interval a, b, and check the value of fc. Since we have two values of different signs, a and b, of course, f at c has to take either positive or negative value. And depending on this, we, instead of a, b, we take a smaller interval, this half of this interval, uh, the ones that are of interest to us, that so has uh, also opposite signs. And by repeating this procedure, we will make this interval smaller, 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 until we reach this higher, this higher accuracy of a uh, zero. So let's do it. This some strange function. We have a, which is minus two, we have b, which is two, and we have point c in the middle. Oh, this, this red, red, red rectangle will, will denote the middle of the interval. So right now, this is minus 2, 2. So we want to minimize the function on the interval minus 2, 2. And of course, we see that there is some zero, right? Because it's positive here, it's negative here. There must be some point, but we don't know which one. So I, I wrote some code for bisection method somewhere under, under the hood, and I will just run it for some number of iterations. And let's see what's going on. So after one iteration, oh, after one iteration, uh, we have we have intervals smaller, right? It's, we just take this part. If I continue, we will take smaller, 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 and so on. So hop, 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 and basically we are already so close that you don't see even this interval because ba basically a and b are so close close to, together. I can still continue. I can continue, continue, continue. And you see that all this A, B, C, three, three numbers, they like, they almost bump into each other. They become closer, closer, closer. And of course, our zero must be between A and B. And because we can continue as far as we want, we can solve, we can find the zero of this function with arbitrary precision and very quickly. Okay, no questions. Okay, good. So, um, so, okay, but just just don't think that everything is so simple in uh, high dimension, because in R it's really easy. There is no not to, not much space. We just can explore one line, right, and and find everything very easily. When we have a plane or even like high dimension, there are too much flexibility. We can go in many many directions, and because of that, all the met all methods become 
more, more difficult, more complicated. They, they require like deeper analysis. So I will not describe any, any algorithms like for gen generic minimization. Instead, I will, I will just say that like we, we use it, but I will not explain how, how exactly they, they look. And instead, I will talk more about why we need optimization for machine learning. I will describe what is machine learning a bit and so on, because it's kind of very popular nowadays. So maybe it will be of interest to you. So now we will switch to applications. Uh, so what is machine learning? And obviously I'm not going to cover everything. Obviously there will be some errors that I will not mention something and I'm not going to, to, to be very boring. I will just talk about what, what I like and the simplest things. So what is my mission? So machine learning probably, you, probably, I hope you heard about it, but uh, maybe you heard about ChatGPT, maybe you heard about neural networks, whatever. Definitely you use Google search, you, you use probably Google translate and so on. And all these uh, machines, they're powered by machine learning. Before they use something different, but nowadays they all use machine learning. So how does it work? So in the very beginning, we have to collect some data set, label data set. Label data set means that we collect something, uh, maybe pieces of text, maybe images, maybe emails, which is, and then we want to label them. It can be manual work, whatever. We don't interested in this, but we assume that it's label data set. So if it's email, we can we can label them as it, this email is spam. This email is not spam. Spam, not spam. Spam, not spam. That's what we do with emails. These images, we can label them. This image has a car. This image doesn't have a car. And so on. This text, this text means this in, means it's a rough translation, but like we can denote something with this text and so on. So that, that is what data set. Uh, then we develop a model and we want to train it. To train a model, it means we formulate some optimization problem and we want to solve this problem. We solve this optimization problem. And then when we solve this optimization problem, we apply our data for data, uh, we apply our model for data that is not classified yet, that is not labeled because we, we, take, we cannot take all data in the world. We take some pictures, that has car or doesn't have a car, like thousands of these pictures, millions of these pictures. But we want to develop a model where we can classify in the future new pictures, right? Whether they have cars or not, whether, email, whether future email that you will receive, whether it's spam or not spam. So we collect just some small portion kind of data that exists in the world. We hope our model will be powerful enough so it can capture something in this data set and we can generalize it to future like more larger models so that's that's how basic machine learning uh, works i maybe it's a bit abstract at the moment and it, it's fine it's not that you really need to understand all the bits we will go with some concrete data set uh, soon and maybe it will be easier for you uh, but oh, any, anyway you can also interrupt me and ask questions because for sure that i'm here uh, okay, and we will do today classification of digits. So here's on the left, we have a data set. As I said, we have a, we should have some label data set. So this is a data set of, of digits, handwritten digits. So people wrote some digits, let's say on zip code. I think it's actually from zip code from, from US. So when you write a letter to someone, right? You, you write by, by hand uh, your, uh, some, some, dig some digits in the zip code and in post service need to classify where this, like to check which, is, which zip code has this letter and so on. And manually, if you have millions or like whatever, hundreds of thousands of letters, it's, it's a lot of work. So of course it's much better to develop a machine that can do it efficiently. There's not many mistakes. Some mistakes may be unavoidable, but we want to have as little mistakes as, as we can. So this is this kind of a data set. So we have on the left, we have some images. On the right, we have the labels. So we know actually right now, we know 
so and the, I mean, of course, we see it, but I mean, we know it that even without seeing it, we know that the first image is eight. The second image is four. Uh, oh, sorry, it's it's by column wise. The first is four, the third is one, and so on. We have to to look at for, by column wise, not not row wise. So that's our data set. Uh, okay, but that's that's images, and like what we are going to do with images? How we are going even to to start this? So let's let's understand what is an image. So this is an image, like I just enlarge the first image, or not the first one, doesn't matter. So it's 20, 28 by 28 pixels. And by pixel, I mean, you see, it's like small, we have these small boxes, small rectangles here, or squares, and we have like 28 of them. And this is a, for simplicity, I only consider gray picture, or black and white pictures, meaning that each pixel, it either, it, it, it can be very black or like completely white and takes some values in between, a bit gray, grayish and like not so black and so on. So kind of continuous scale from very black to very white. That's, that's a very important concept because like when you look at something, when you make a picture with your phone, unlike you think that it's actually an array of like a, some, 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 num some, some like, array of digits. The same when you watch a movie, the same when you listen to the music, what, whatever you're doing. And that's why mathematics is so important nowadays because everything that is surrounded us, any technology, any data is actually some digits. It's like we translate everything into mathematics or these mathematics into some numbers. And then we need to know how to work with these numbers. So that's what we do with image. So on one hand, it's an image. On other hand, if I look at the data actually that is behind, you see it's a 28 by 28 matrix of some float numbers, whatever, it doesn't matter what, what it means. And you see there are many, many zeros. Why there are so many zeros? I hope it's clear, right? We have too, so much of uh, what happened, yeah. We have so much of black color. So here you don't see much of as it, because there are three dots, but I think it's clear, right? You have these zero, zero, zeros, and there are some numbers in the middle. It just uh, it's so big I cannot represent all the numbers. Uh, so that's that's what what the image is. So it has a very clear mathematical representation. It's just a table or a matrix of uh, values between zero and one. And we can do some some cool stuff with images. Like so let's, let's say. You want to make a column in the middle white, whatever for whatever reason. What does it mean to, to have a column of white? We just say that this in this table, we assign the value one because we know that one is is one it denotes white color. So if you do it, just one line of code, and we have this image the same as before, but with all all white one. And we can play as 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 much as you want. So the important thing here is that to remember that all these images are, are numbers. And if you know how to manipulate these numbers, we can do any tricks uh, with images. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's back to our MANIST data set. This data set contains six, uh, 60,000 images. Each image, as we uh, saw just, in the, uh, just before, uh, is 28 by 28 pixels, which means in total is like a bit more than 700 pixels. And we saw that each pixel takes a value between 0 and 1. Important thing to, to understand here is that we represent this matrix or table of, of, of numbers as just one vector in, that lives in uh, 784 dimensional space. How can we represent? We just take, like, let's say, we take it column-wise. We take first column, then we stack the second column together, then we take the third column and stack together. So we stack, we flatten the array, one can say. So in this way, right, our matrix or table of numbers will be just a one very long vector. Vector that lives in 784 space. So, and we have 60,000 of such vectors in this space. Right? Okay. Okay, so the main goal is to classify, right, these digits, these images. We want to understand uh, what is zero, what is one, and so on. 
So what is classification means? And but so in, in general, of course, we want to classify all the digits, like what, what is what? What is one, what is two, what is five, whatever. But today, because we want to be more or less quick, efficient, we want to run the algorithm today and finish and like not to wait uh, for too long. Uh, we will just classify two digits. Let's say we can, we want to distinguish one digit from another. It's called a binary classification problem. Let's say it's the same what I said before, right? You have emails of, of two times, good email, spam email, pictures that has a car, doesn't have a car. There are many, it's very important, like a binary classification problem. So to, to make it uh, quick, we will just classify today two digits. And I propose for you to vote which two digits you want. So I, I here had the experiment before between zero and six. I saw that zero and six are kind of similar. So maybe it's interesting, not, not much. So I can change two digits if you, if someone is brave enough to propose me some, something else. Yeah, the first one who will tell me some digits, I will, I will pick them, promise. Okay, no one cares. Not bad. No, 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 no. Um, uh, in the chat, Anna proposes two and three. Uh, the first one is one? The first one is two, the second one is three. Okay, so I wrote two and three, right? And just run it. Okay, so our subtask, because our main task is to classify all digits, our small subtask for today is just to classify two and three. And uh, maybe maybe uh, there's another suggestion of one and seven. Actually, three people are suggesting, four people are suggesting one and seven. I'm, uh, if and I have, concur with them. If we, if we have time, because I promise the first person that says, I will pick this two and three, Actually, uh, the, the first person who made a proposition uh, proposed one and seven. Ah, okay, okay. I agree, one and seven. Okay, this is one and seven. We have like more than six images of one, six images and, and seven, right? Among these 60,000. They're like almost like equal, but not, not exactly. Uh, that's what we what we have, and we are, we forget about the rest of the data set. We don't care about the two, three, five, and so on. We just only extract one and seven, and we are going from from this moment to work with one and seven. And I agree, one and seven are interesting because sometimes they and even I sometimes write one and then in the next day I don't know whether it's seven or one. So I agree, it's interesting. So let's see how smart computer can be. Uh, yeah, so. That's basically, I cannot depict all of them. There are too many, but that, that's what you see, right? Some, some basically, some are so bad that I don't know whether it's seven or one, even for, so it's, it's not an easy task. Even if you're a human being, for sure you will make a lot of mistakes because like, what is this? I have no idea what is this. It can be one, it can be seven, it can be, I don't know. Uh, so th that's why it's like not, not a trivial task. And we are going to, to teach computer how to do it. Okay, now forget about these high dimensional spaces. As I said, we cannot imagine high dimensional space. So instead we will work in R2. We will build our intuition in R2. And that's absolutely enough for our purposes. And then it just extends this intuition to higher dimension. So our this subtask is to classify between two classes. We have objects of one class, objects of another class. If we need to learn how to classify them. So uh, in R2, we have blue, blue circles and uh, orange, orange squares or brown, brown squares. And that claims that basically the easiest way to classify them, like the, there is nothing simpler probably, would be to, to classify them linearly, to separate them linearly. And by this, I mean to draw a line here, for simplicity, I will only draw lines through origin. Again, for simplicity, that's our model. That's, that will be sufficient for, for our needs, as we will see. And, uh, but we, it can be generalized, but we don't care about this. So the lines through origin, through zero. And basically, we can say that, yeah, if, if we have this line, we can kind of, it's easy, right? We have like two, two, two parts of the plane. And then we can say, yeah, if it's on the one side, it will be minus one. The label will be minus one. If it's on the other side, 
the any point, it will be with one. What is the issue in this approach? That we kind of assume that we can separate our data linearly with the line. Obviously, I, I can draw another image like this one. And this one is like, I don't think you can, you can separate linearly, right? It's like not, not clear how you're going to draw the lines to the origin that it will really clearly separate them. But as I said before, it's okay. We are, we, no one is perfect and we are not going to build a perfect computer. It's fine if you make some mistakes. Like it, it's fine, but like even some kind of good approximation is all, already enough. Yeah, computer will make some mistakes with some, some letters. Maybe it's actually impossible to recognize those digits. That's, that's also fine. But obviously, there is, like if you see on this data, kind of we see that there are good, good lines that almost separate them and there are bad lines. So for instance, I kind of can separate our data with this line, right? It's almost, there are just three mistakes, three, four mistakes. It's almost like perfect. We have like dozens of points on, on, on both sides and we have just three mistakes. It's kind of acceptable. So this is an easy case. This is kind of, yeah, it's okay. We can separate the almost can separate them linearly. Obviously, I can draw even worse data. I can draw something like this. And basically, you have no chances to separate it, right? What, whatever line you draw, it will be like a nightmare. There will be many, many errors. There are no good, good lines here. So not all data is can be said like to we want to can be approached with this simple approach. Approach is simple. Okay, can be, can this simple simple idea can be applied? But this is crucial and very important idea, and it can be. And I can easily generalize it in slightly more complicated way to cover even this very difficult data that you see. So it's not very difficult. It's like just one step, uh, one step further, and I can solve also these spirals. We will not talk it today because it requires a lot of time, but. It's not much more difficult. But other more, so today we are talking about the simplest model, as I said in the beginning, we will just say, somehow we will assume that our data is like this. We, we, because this is a simplest model and we will see if, the, if our model was, was bad, our assumption was bad, we just start to build more difficult model. But in, for the beginning, it's like, why we should make a more complicated model if this is the simplest one already works. That's also important. Don't don't build something more complicated if simple uh, things already work. Uh, okay, so now let's. That was all geometrical, right? We have some images, points in the plane, whatever. Let's. But we are going to to write some formula and code them in the end. So we don't need pictures. Actually, we need some algebraic notation. So we are going to formulate this problem from geomet from geometry to algebra. Okay, so let's denote these other images or whatever objects in high dimension space by x1, x2, xm. Remember that I use bold form, which means these are vectors, right? Each point is a vector. It's a collection of some number of, of points, each of them, x1, x2, xm. And each of these x has a label y1, y2, ym. And since there are just two classes, uh, what was that? Uh, one and seven. Uh, I, I just denoted the, for simplicity as plus one and minus one because it's easier to work with plus one and minus one. So plus one is one, minus one is seven. And we can just read, obviously, it's, it's like equivalent. Uh, okay. So since we did all this geometry in R2, let's see what does it mean, uh, this formula. We draw a line, right? We draw a line through the origin. Maybe you know that the equation of the line through origin has this form x1 v1 plus x2 v2 equal to zero. It's like the slightly strange maybe notation for you, but obviously it's 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 actually the correct equation for of line because it also covers the vertical line, right? The vertical line is kind of hard because usually at school you just say that one is something like this. Uh, I don't remember how it's school we draw, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So it's easy to see that this is an equation of, of line, right? And here, I mean, v1, v2 are the coefficients or parameters that define the line. And x is a free variable that goes along the line. 
And since we remember our notation in the very beginning, as I said, it's, it's important to remember what this color product is. So instead of writing such long equation, we can just say that, okay, X is the two numbers. Zero. And that's a, it's a equation uh, of, of our line. And what we can say, we can say that uh, if, this, if this inner product, this color product, the scalar product or inner product is the same. I can just say sometimes in, with one word, sometimes with another. Uh, so how you can classify? If this inner scalar product is positive, we can say it's our one class with plus one. If it's negative, meaning geometrically, it means it's above line or below line or on the right hand side, on the left hand side, it's another. So that's what it means in terms of algebra. We compute inner product. And just see what is the sign of this inner product, whether it's positive or negative. Okay, so that's what we are doing in R2. Let's see what we, are, what we need to do in R3. In R3, as you probably already uh, thought, we just add one term everywhere. We just add x3, v3. And this will be, now, now it's not a line. Now it's a creation of a plane that goes through origin. And of course, in algebraic notation, these vectors is just the same. It's x multiplied by b, the, the scalar product. And again, we have the same situation. If this inner scalar product is positive, we say it's plus one, the one class. If it's negative, we say it's another class, and, and so on. And obviously, you don't need to be genius to extend it just like naturally to Rn. It just probably you already know what to do. Um, it just, because it's Rn, we have to use different word. We, I mean, sometimes we can say plane, but it's more, more usually more standard to say hyperplane, just to, to, uh, to explain that it's Rn and it's not R2. But it's the, the idea is the same, of course. Line, plane, hyperplane. Uh, so we just added three dots, added Xn, Vn, and write in, in algebraic notation these vectors like just a scalar product of x and b plus to zero. And again, we have whether it's positive or negative the sign. Obviously, if you, not, if you say that n is two, we will recover the first case. If you said n equals three, we'll recover the second case and so on. So very easy, right? You just, we have to just to remember what is the inner product between or scalar product between x and b. That's okay, so that's what separation by plane, by line, by hyperplane means. And that's how we're going to classify other objects. Okay, any questions? No, okay, good. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So we are going to classify our data by means of logistic regression. Whatever it means, it's just I use some fancy words, you don't need to understand nice of them. So remember, uh, we have other objects, x1, x2, xm, and there they are other images, it's one and seven. Each image lives in 784 dimensional space. Why? I, they are labels. It's either plus one uh, if it's one and minus one if it's seven. Okay, so now we are construct our model, as I said, right? We collected data set. Now we need to, to construct a model. And our model is the following. Uh, we say that we want to find the vector v and look at the sign of this scalar product. If the scalar product is positive, then we say it's one. If it's negative, then we say uh, it's minus one. And of course, it's, it doesn't mean that this v, vector v exists. We just want to find it. If maybe we cannot find it, so we want to find some approximation. So in order to find this approximation, we introduce this function. I will explain in a moment why this function and want something else logarithm of one plus e to the minus t. And we consider some, maybe it's a bit complicated at the first glance, but in a moment, you, 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 I will try to give you some intuition. So we take this function phi and apply it to every inner product. So we, we have this like m inner products, one inner product, and we apply it to everyone. Why one? And of course I multiply by a label because I want to see, notice that if I multiply by label, if my label is plus, then it's just always plus. If my label is minus one, then it means it's here. So this product kind of has 
has to be always positive. That's the, that's the idea. And if you don't want to write phi, we just write it like this log of it, log of one plus blah, blah, blah. It just like, you don't need to really understand what, what, what's going on. And just like, yeah, we, we define some function, right? It's clear that it's some function. It's clear how to compute it, right? I give you, I gave you vector V, you just substitute, you compute all these inner products, you take calculator, whatever, and you, you give me a value of positive function, right? It's, it's completely clear. And of course, this function is always well-defined because it's one plus something positive, right? One plus E to something. So it's, since this is always positive, you can take logarithm, everything is well-defined and so on. And okay, so let's understand why, why this function and not something else. One reason for this has some like statistical prob probabilistic meaning, but it's like a bit too difficult and we are not going to mention this. For us, it's just enough, very basic, simple intuition. So first of all, let's plot, uh, let's plot. Okay, so this is, this is how the plot of this function phi looks like. Notice that very quickly when t is large, by large I mean just like four, six or whatever, the function value becomes very, very small, right? Very small. And like if it's 10, it's already basically undistinguished, distinguishable from zero. So now if you go back, our goal is to minimize function. To minimize meaning that we, we would like to have each term small enough, right? We, we want them small. Small means that uh, this t has to be large. And t here is like it's this product, y1, x1, v, y1, ym, xm, v. Each of these ter terms has to be uh, positive, right? Because that's when the function is small. We would, we would like, because we know, we, we, we know that uh, this function is small, phi, phi is small, when t is positive kind of. The larger t is a smaller function, but at least it has to be positive. So that's what we are going to do. We want to have each of these terms positive. But each term is positive is exactly means what's written here, because y is either plus one or minus one. So if, if y m is minus one, then it's in the product has to be minus one. That's how we get positive value, right? We take two negative numbers, multiply, we, get, we have a positive number. It doesn't mean that we can, all of these terms have, have to, like all these terms, these products can be positive at the same time. We don't know. We don't know yet in advance. But it's already kind of idea I hope is clear, right? Maybe majority of them will be positive because we are not going to classify, classify our data perfectly. We, we allow ourselves for some mistakes. Our goal is just to make sure that like in total function value is small enough. And we hope that maybe it's sufficient. It's not, if it's not sufficient, then we are going to do something else. That's important moment because that's, that's what's basically main machine learning goal, right? We build a model and then we, next, next thing, we will just solve, we will solve this problem. We apply some minimization algorithm and solve this problem. But that's the idea. And it's, it's just our choice how we, how we construct this model. Of course, nowadays, like 99% of all the models, um, they use neural networks, which also maybe it looks, sounds very fancy, but it's just a bit more complicated functions than this one. Here is a very simple function, logistic regression, neural network, it's just more complicated function, but the essence is completely the same. Okay, so uh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, in email, I was told that I can make some breaks or I must make a break. So now uh, I'm asking, should we make a break or not? It's uh, Maybe are there any questions from the audience? Usually we use the break to answer questions. Okay, perfect. So if there are no questions so far, we may as well continue straight away. Okay. Uh, okay, so we constructed the model. It's a function f. And next thing, we are going to minimize this function. Uh, okay, M by minimizing a function, it means we need we are training a model, right? There are two different languages. In optimization, we say we minimize a function, we solve the problem, but in machine learning, we train a model because actually what you're interested in, in training a model. That's what you do, train a model, you, you learn it. 
or, you, or you, let's say you teach it. Uh, I apply the simplest algorithm in continuous optimization here. It's called gradient descent, right? So gradient descent computes, it requires a derivative. Now we have to compute derivative for our function f and our function f values. Uh, so we apply it. I am not going to, like the code is very simple, but it's not important. So I applied this, I wrote this line of, of code here. I run it. I actually, I didn't run it yet because I changed digits. So I will do it in a moment. So now I'm doing uh, it. It takes some seconds, maybe. Yeah, some time. It takes some time. Okay, it it ah, okay. So it already computed the, the, uh, those numbers. It computed those numbers, and now let's make some plots and see how what algorithm actually gave us. So how what are the ways to check whether it's a nonsense or not what the algorithm computed? So first thing we can check how other function values right change along iteration because we are going to solve minimization problem. We would like to see that function values actually decreased. So let's see whether it's true or not. Okay, not bad, right? Our function values indeed decrease. And because it's 10 to the power of four, we, we cannot see, see much, but like it's not so important for us. We, we see that, yeah, they, they decrease this time. You can see, we can take a logarithmic scale to or zoom, zoom in if you need, but that's not important. At least we see that it seems like our algorithm is doing its job. It decreases the value of function. Okay, what else we can check? We remember, right? That it's remember it's it was unconstrained optimization problem, and we we said we said that before we said that um, if x have a solution, then have a gradient or derivative has to be zero. But I mean, I hope it's clear, right? That it just has to like decrease like the magnitude of gradient, right? This time also have to decrease. So let's also check the magnitude or the norm, the like absolute value of this vector the length of this vector, which is derivative. So let's check how it looks. Okay, also good, not bad. It also decreases. But obviously, uh, okay, it's like a different plot, but it's easy to see that it's not zero. It's far from zero yet. Be I mean, because it's scaled 10 to the power of four and you don't have scaled 10 to the power of three, two, one, right? So it's still quite large actually. But we run algorithm just for 100 iterations. We can continue running it, but maybe we don't need because it's again our task was not to solve minimization problem. Our main task is to classify digits. Maybe that's already enough. I don't know actually. I never run this code with one and seven. I think uh, so. Maybe it will perform very poorly. At least it doesn't mean that our optimization problem means something that we can classify digits. So we just run something in the beginning and then we will tinker to see whether it's good or not. Should we recompute something, change a model or not? So that's a magnitude of the derivative. Magnitude means the length of this vector, right? And it has, in the end, it has to be zero. It's not zero yet, but maybe it's already good for us. But importantly, we need to check uh, how, how many digits we actually recognize. So like we'll, we'll, we'll see how many, how many mistakes we did or whatever. So that's what we say, percentage of correctly classified digits. Okay, so not so bad, like you look. We started from something around 50% because the initial point, I don't know, which just took a random initial point. So it's like, not bad, right? Obviously it's just half is correct, half is wrong because like kind of a random point. And then very, very quickly, it started to increase. We, we'll, we, and now we basically, after 100 iterations, we basically very close to 100%, meaning that we almost, recognize all the digits right all like not we, we, it's not 100 I, as i said we can we allow ourselves for some mistakes but it's not so bad it's almost 100 percent. even with this simplest model just 100 of iteration it took like a few seconds and like quickly we found the solution for this problem but to be honest i lied to you because this data, no one interested in this data. This data already is labeled. And maybe it's something, it's just because of the algorithm, maybe 
I wrote some spooky code that actually output the labels of all the digits and I just made by myself a few mistakes that just to pretend it. So no one cares about the good result, good performance on this data set because this data set was already labeled and we use these labels in the code, right? It's like, <laughs> it's very easy kind of to, to have even 100% if you have this data set. People in practice, like in life, everywhere, they're interested how your algorithm or your model will perform on the unseen data. That's what it matters. When you don't know which, like you gave me, you gave me an image and I don't have its label. I just input this image into my model and it, it outputs a digit. That's why, that's why it's important. So actually, the, that's what is called training versus testing. The, 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 this procedure before, before this, all these steps, it was called a training procedure. Like we train our model. And in the end, we are going to do testing. We, we will use another data set and test on it. So in the beginning, I said the Menis collection contains six, 60,000 images and it was training data set. But I didn't mention that there are another 10,000 of images and we never use this. Like I, I separated it from the very beginning. It was like it never used in the algorithm. So it's in total, it's like actually 70,000 images. And this 10,000 images is called test, test data set. And that's where we use it for final benchmarks. So this, this is called a test error. So before it was a uh, train error, which was almost like 100%. Like so now we will do the same, but this test data. Uh, so, and, uh, and on a test data set, yeah, as good as before, actually. Surprisingly, I mean, of course I expected this, but like still it's good to see that we are almost close to 100%. And actually if you plot to, we combine these two plots. Okay, they are almost they almost coincide, which is maybe a bit strange. But on the other hand, it means that our data set is too simple. It means that like our model is so powerful that even our assumption that separations through like uh, of like hyperplane that goes through origin covers completely. It, it like our, although maybe it looks that our, our problem is difficult for this type of problems. Other like logistic regression model is is very powerful and it captures more or less everything. So uh, it's then they they are not the same. It's not that I, I showed just yet you two two lines. They're different, but the the difference is is like marginal. That's why the two lines almost coincide. And maybe it will be interesting to see where did mistakes on which digits our algorithm made mistake because it's not one hundred percent. Okay. So that's, let's, I will run. Yeah, so th that's examples of wrongly classified images. And to be honest, I don't know. I mean, some of them, yeah, I see that I don't know whether it's one or seven, same here, but some of them are clearly seven and still algorithm made mistakes. Uh, but remember, we had like 6,000 of ones, 6,000 of sevens, like a lot of, a lot of e mistakes. And it's, it's just a part of, of course, of mistakes, but, even if you have a hundreds of mistakes, it's okay. It's quite acceptable. Uh, okay, I think it's it's all for today. I'm open to all your questions. Maybe something was not clear. I can repeat. We can go back and rerun some algorithms with other digits if you're interested and so on. So let's experiment and explore things if you want. Hey, thank you for this uh, great lecture today. Um, really cool stuff. Uh, any questions from the audience on machine learning? So we've seen a very basic case of machine learning. Uh, it's a huge expanding, quickly expanding field. Any questions? Maybe, maybe are, hold on, there are questions now. So, uh, uh, David, uh, would you like to ask the question yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I'd like to ask, uh, how do we um, find this number? So uh, you mentioned an example with the letters and uh, the 
digits on the envelope. So we have a paper sheet and on it there are some, mm, mm, some numbers. Mm -hmm. And how do we find them? I mean, there is uh, one, for example, in this black square, but it, uh, we can move it a bit to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. And will our model work the same good? For example, one and seven, sometimes they are uh, quite similar. And a uh, well positioned seven may be better than a bad positioned one. That's what I mean. Yep, that's a very good question. So um, that's, that's what is called pre-processing of data. So as you see, all these, all these digits kind of, they have this black canvas on both sides and the, the digits actually in the very center. But if you have some other data set, we can always do some pre-processing because this is just, as I said before, these are just numbers. We can always make this canvas of black if it's important for us. We can always put the digits in the center. So you're right, maybe it matters. And this data set is intentionally was pre-processed to make it beautiful and, and so on. But we can do this with our future data set as well because that's what is called, we, we need to normalize data. Maybe, maybe it's, because you're, you're right, maybe some data is skewed, maybe some points are very large, has very large values and some, some coordinates has very small and you will have some errors because of that, uh, either in, because of a computer or because of something else. Uh, so indeed, we have to kind of take an average to move our data, to central it and so on. That's, that's all, it's like the most important things in the beginning before you develop your model. You mean we take the, uh, hmm, the white pixel with the biggest uh, uh, coordinate with the, so the highest white pixel, the lowest white pixel, then put it to the center of this black square. And then we say that uh, this piece of data, it is, uh, it is okay and we can appear to our model, right? Um, I mean, it's not, I mean, all other pixel is between zero and one. So it's not that we have very large values there, but it's, if it's, a, I mean, it's very easy to, to say that like what is not black and what is not black, it, it represents other objects, right? In this case. Mm -hmm. So it's because of that, it, even if it's 0 0.5, it's, you still kind of see what is not zero and you can mm -hmm. make it in the center. Mm -hmm. so okay. in that sense, Thank you. It's, it's, and you can do it with any other images as well, of course. So it's not. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question, question from Ashia uh, from Vili. Yeah, yeah um, my question is that, like, how do you apply, I mean, machine learning, uh, I mean, the really not optimization that we learned in, um, like sound classification, like over here, we, we try to identify numbers, but like if we were trying to identify the pitch or instrument of like an audio file or something, I don't know if the like, question makes sense, but. Mm, okay, just to understand, uh, you're asking how you, would, how you would classify some musical composition by instruments, their performance or whatever? Yeah, or pitch, yeah. Oh, um, okay. This is just my guess. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but let's say the the music the music sounds that you are listening to it's also the series of digits. Um, so in, in, so in a, in essence, if if it's it's possible, I I don't know in a sense whether we can capture musical instrument from the data, but if it's like theoretically possible. Uh, because I, I, the problem is that I believe that some of the music can be performed by violin or piano, and it, yeah. in, in a sense, it would be kind of the same melody and so on. So I'm not sure that it, it can capture the instrument, but it, it can capture, like whether it's, uh, I don't know, min, min, minor or major, it can capture all of other things, right? So for these things, for sure, you can develop a machine learning model. For instruments, I'm just not familiar with music enough to tell you whether it's theoretically possible. But if it's possible, theoretically, then for sure you can develop machine learning model for this. You just collect a lot of data, you do it manually, you say this piece of music 
is, was played by guitar. This piece of music was played by piano, whatever. And if it's theoretically it's possible to get this data, your machine learning is the model. If it's rich enough, it will learn because it's not, not different from images or whatever text. Okay, so I mean, I know that like we can express like it's as a sum of waves and that, that, that you can encode, but I, I might think like, how do you, like over here, you have an obvious thing like black and white uh, and ones and zeros, but like I thought in, like in, in an audio file, like how do you do that? I mean, I guess that's more of an engineering question rather than like a, Okay, yeah, it's, in, it's of course, it's more engineering question, but okay. you're right. So you can represent any sound by, by like sum of, of waves. So okay. sum of waves is basically, you just need, because saves, you know the shape of waves and you only need to, to know kind of a multiplier to this, for these waves and you they, they have a summation. It's a very like, it's, it, it's not a, it's like very basic kind of approach because of course, nowadays to have efficient, uh, efficiently work with music you do more in a more complicated way but superficially it's like any sound is a sum of waves but waves can be larger smaller you multiply it by some factors and so on so you only need these factors to represent some melody in the end so in a sense your music is also is a some long vector so in the end you play this vector of whatever of real numbers it, you don't need to be it between zero and one it's just arbitrary Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from Constantine. Yeah, uh, one question you talked about uh, linearly splitting the data. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, could you possibly give an example of another algorithm? Uh, one, for example, of uh, the spiral that you gave. Yeah. Um... So you don't even need another algorithm. You do you you apply the same algorithm. You just if you have an idea that uh, your data might be not linear or separable, that like linear separation is a bad thing to do. Your your data set is more complicated. You basically lift your data to a higher dimension. In a sense, right? This is two dimensional data, but if you make it three dimensional in some interesting way, basically like you transform it, you add another coordinate. You like instead of it's like flat now, but right, you kind of rotate it somehow or whatever. Then in high dimension, because you have more flexibility in high dimension, then you can actually linearly separate it. And you apply the same algorithm, it just you transform your data in something more complicated. So that's that's basically it. Like it's like a first first example how you can do it. So it works most of the time, just uh, changing the dimension and then separating. No, I mean, that. but no, of course, I, I'm simplifying. It's not that like you change in dimension. You have to think how to change the dimension. It's like you have to apply some nonlinear transformation for this data with the hope that this nonlinear transformation is exactly what you need. It's just you take some random kind of, it's called kernel. You apply this nonlinear transformation to your data. Now it leaves instead of two dimensions, it leaves in 100 dimensional space. Like, okay, maybe it will work. You'll just try it. Like, you never know in advance, basically, that it will work unless it's very some restricted case. So in a sense, you see the two-dimensional case, no, error is very bad. Okay, let's do it in some other space, like 100 dimension and, and so on. Yuri, I think we can leave it as a home exercise to find a transformation from R2 to R3, which can in some sense, simplify data in this case. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In a sense, then you can make it actually linear separable. Yeah, try to find such such a transformation, a function from R2 to R3. I think that's that not should be very difficult. Yeah. And you don't need like exact data points. Just imagine that this is some spiral kind of, uh, that, that's, that's enough for this to know. Uh, okay, so thank you. You really like linear separation, Yuri. Is are there other types of separation? Uh, so as I said, it's in a sense, um, if you're talking about separation, it's like when we when we lift our data in a high dimension space, then there we can linearly separate data, but then we still have to go back 
And then we can represent even like nonlinear separation of our data, but still, so in essence, we kind of pretend that you know, we, we, we do linear separation in thousand dimensional space, mm -hmm. and we project it back and we, we can plot the picture and it looks completely nonlinear, like with polynomials or with circular shapes, whatever. So in a sense, in R2, we observe that it's not a linear separation. And of course, but in essence, it's still linear, just in a higher dimensional space. So the art would be to find an appropriate transformation for some uh, kind of dimensional no, space. It's, it's not that hard. It depends. It, de in, it depends kind of how much time you can invest and how, how big your data is. For this one, it's very easy to find. Like you just run a few experiments and see, right, right? But sometimes you have to run your algorithm for days. And if it doesn't work, you have to do it from the beginning. So that's why it's expensive. And that's why neural networks are so popular nowadays. Because for them, it's very easy. Like whatever you try with neural networks, everything works. Even you don't have any, you don't know the reason why it works. Uh, it's easy to kind of easy to run, but that's why it's like so powerful. You don't need to to work for so long with uh, with simpler models as it is. But theoretically, these models are also very generic. Okay. Uh, another question from Flat. Hello, the question is: uh, If we want that uh, our program will identify numbers from one to one hundred. Does it mean that uh, it will make more mistakes than with only two numbers? And uh, if the answer is yes, uh, the difference will be huge or not? Like 95% uh, uh, of right answers or else? So, so Vlad, I, could, you, could you say it a bit louder? I, I, I really misheard the beginning of your question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, now it's better. Um, if we want that uh, our program will identify numbers from, let's say, uh, 1 and to 100, is it means that uh, it will make more mistakes, like with only two numbers? If the no answer is yes, is the uh, difference will be huge? You mean not hundred? You mean digits from zero to ten, right? If you're starting to compare, not just two digits, but maybe yes. Uh, I mean, most likely yes, because we have fl more flexibility. Of course, we just compare two digits. It's also, I, I think, I expected a different question. I expected, but how are you going to classify if you have ten classes, ten or ten objects, right? It's not like it's 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 it, more, more different, of course. We cannot just put 10 classes of objects and do it linear separation. So that's already not non-trivial how to do. There are approaches like, for instance, if you're going to apply the same technique, because there are different techniques, but with the same technique, let's say we can do what? We can say we have digits one and all other digits. And all other digits we, we combine together. So we kind of it's it's called one versus all. We we want to separate one from everything else. Then we do the same these two from everything else and so on and then we combine these results that's the the first the simplest approach it's more expensive of course because you have to do it 10 times instead of one but this is also possible uh, so in terms of error i i think i think yeah the error will be slightly larger but obviously you have to run and see uh, so it's not clear Maybe it will be the same. You, you never know. It's it's not like mathematics that you can really calculate something and know for sure. This is all very experimental things. Even if I run the same algorithm with a different random point, it may happen that our error will change. So it's not that like my error is exactly like this. It's fixed. I will run algorithm for different number of iterations. The error will be slightly different. Still very good because it's, it's a simple data set and... Uh, other function is like powerful enough to capture it, but slightly different, so not clear. Uh, David uh, from Georgia is asking why the function one plus e to the minus t is so special. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so as I said, it's a good. It's not that you can do it with only this function. You, there are many like dozens of other functions that uh, you, that you can choose. 
on one hand, it has a very basic algebraic meaning, right? As I explained, if this inner, if this inner product is kind of, uh, it, it forces all these terms, y1, x1 multiplied by v to be positive. Forces in a sense, other, because otherwise function value will be large. So it, it forces the majority of these terms to be positive. But of course, there are many other functions that can do the same. So, so first reason is, that, as I said, there, are also, there is also statistical or probabilistic interpretation of this, this model. So like, what does it mean? Like why we choose this function? Because it, but it's slightly more complicated. We will not go into this. Another thing is that this function is very simple. First of all, it's differentiable, meaning that, yeah, it's good because right, as I said, it, from the very beginning, we started from differentiable function. So if a function is differentiable, it's good. If this function is differentiable, this function is, convex, I don't know whether you know what is on or not, but convexity is like this kind of shape. And it's very good if function is convex. It means that it's easy to minimize convex function. So for instance, this function is convex, as you see. Uh, I think I made a plot. Where is plot? Uh, ah, here it is. So this function is convex, for instance, at least something. Uh, but but yeah, that's not the only function you can do. There are plenty of other functions with which you can apply the same. It just, it's just known to be powerful to capture a lot of things for simple data sets. Philip, uh, here's another question. I think we need to ask my question because we've, all, we've already had answered. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, does anybody else, would anybody else like to ask a question? Um, the, okay, so I'm reading another question from the chat to you. Um, if we talk about creating a network, can you give some advice on choosing the best parameters for it? Neurons, layers. Also, can you advise where I can get computing power to train my own networks? Uh, regarding the first question is, it's not that I can give you advice. You, you construct your neural network and then you run an algorithm, right? You run some variation of the algorithm that we run today. Let's say some, it's called stochastic gradient descent. So if it's a simple neural network, you can run the same, exactly the same algorithm that we run today. If it's a larger neural network, you run something simpler. So the algorithm finds the parameters for you. It's not that a human being, any human being on our planet can recommend you some parameters to use. No, you just, you start from some random parameters as I did today. I choose some random initial point and then I run an algorithm and the algorithm found me uh, good parameters. For my case, it was good. Then says, let's hope it will be the same for your case. In terms of uh, computing power, I think... Uh, Google has some limited uh, resources. So in a sense, if your neural network is not large, uh, I, I, I forgot how, it, maybe it's, it's called Google Colab. There is some service where you can do, do it, maybe something else, uh, but for sure you can register there and run some simple experiments to, to, to play with. So if, if it's not super industrial, if you're not going to build a new chat GPT, uh, just to play something simple, if it's something simple, yeah, you can try it. I think it's a, it's a good service to, to start playing. Very cool. Um, so I think it's a good point uh, to call it uh, a special lecture. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, again, Yuri, and maybe may I ask the Ukrainian students uh, to stay behind since Yuri is also from Ukraine. Uh, maybe you can take some time to chat and ask uh, some questions in, in Ukrainian. Yeah, uh, sure. Be happy. For everyone else, I say thank you very much for attending. And uh, let me just briefly announce uh, our next lecture tomorrow by Kostiantin Drach on fractals, complex dynamics, and finding roots of polynomials, uh, same time as today. Um, have a good evening or morning, uh, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot for attention.